and we do so with a great deal of, of pride and confidence that what we're doing is very useful. Um, why is it that we delivered this boot camp on Ethica and why is it that we, um, that we build custom apps in some circumstance? I'm going to try to address this question a little bit. Um, first, I want to talk about uh, this issue of estimated budgets um, and timelines. So if you're thinking about an Ethica study, what elements of budget need to be foremost in your mind? Well, um, some of the major costs I've listed here. Um, this is not exhaustive, um, and it evolves over time, but um, I've listed some of the major items. Recruitment costs. Uh, so if you're advertising via Facebook, or you are putting ads into uh, a, a community forum that, that has some charge associated with it, if you are doing promotions via posters and you know, printed costs, what have you, um, there's some, some costs there. And often that involves staff time more than anything else. So you have staff who go out to community centers and talk about this, who go to the YWCA and try to recruit participants or what have you. Um, a, a significant cost for most studies, a very significant cost, is what I've badly termed incentives there. Um, uh, they are compensatory arrangements or gr gratuities, thank yous um, for, for involvement. And often we make them per participant per month. I like to encourage adherence prorating. Um, uh, Cheryl, for your study, was there any sort of um, uh, changing of the amount of, of, of compensation paid based on uh, degree of participation? We, we did a little bit. Um, we, were, we were probably relatively generous with our, with our compensation, but for the most part, adherence was good enough yeah. that it wasn't a major issue. Uh, basically, if it looked like somebody had made a sincere effort for a good chunk of the time because it, it stretched out so long, right? Yep. So, but there was, if they didn't do anything, it was, the, the compensation was chunked. And yeah, it wasn't, tiered. Uh, yeah, it was tiered, so that they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't get paid the whole amount unless they had at least done something on every, every piece. That's very helpful. Tina, very helpful, I'm, I'm great for those comments. Tina has done extraordinary work in looking at metrics, and, and uh, she's not here yet, but um, actually, she had some health issue. I'm going to worry about a finger. But um, she, uh, uh, Tina has done some amazing work looking at different metrics like what fraction of participants have answered at least one survey per day um, during this period of time versus, you know, look at another metric of what fraction of surveys that they answered or, you know, um, uh, components of what fraction of the time did they were they reporting GPS data, etc. So there's various um, mechanisms you can you can use to recognize involvement. But I I share Cheryl's sense that look if you can if you can tier it so that people don't just get paid formulaically for doing essentially nothing, but they are compensated if they seem to make a genuine effort of some sort, even if they live very busy lives and don't have time to answer all things. That's probably a good way to, to do it. We don't want to penalize people for being part of the study if they're juggling multiple jobs and you know they don't always have time to answer the, the surveys. Making sure we don't exclude such people is important for a lot of studies. And that's part of, of being equitable, I think, is, is making sure that that you don't ding people, you know, gratuitously. Um, for some plans, for some studies, of the data plans, um, you know, analysis. You'll be hearing a lot more about it uh, this afternoon. Um, um, there's a lot of analysis you could do with stock packages. If you have lots of sensor data and you want to make sense of it, 
you need to either have skills in your immediate collaboration network yourselves or, or uh, partners um, that, that can help with that. Really, it's um, uh, sensor data where often there's um, you know, extra analysis needs and the, the tools of big data come to the fore. Um, so there are costs associated with data storage and, and, and maintenance. Um, most of the time that's, that's on the Ethica side. There have been some studies which have sought to bring data storage for the data collected into their own facility. For example, our partners um, who are in uh, institutions overseas sometimes want uh, uh, data stored there locally. One of our early work with University of Michigan, they wanted all the data stored at University of Michigan and for a, a, pre, uh, a predecessor to Ethica. And um, wherever it's stored, there's costs associated with it. Um, and the costs are different per type of data, which gets to Ethica's pricing model, um, which recognizes that. The basic deal is there's certain types of data collection from accelerometry, from gyroscope, um, particularly. The, am I missing one or two other uh, data sources which are particularly voluminous? Uh, the, the, the raw motion sensor data, okay. accelerometry. Sure, sure. Like and, and related ones. Of uh, those six data sources that Mohammed showed yesterday, those, those have a huge footprint, and it's actually it's actually recognized where that data is stored, with the, the particular systems used to store it um, uh, in Ethica's infrastructure. It's, it's very large. And I think Mohammed told me at one point um, that data is, you know, formed 80% of all Ethica collected data was just like one, a small number of studies had this um, motion sensor data. And um, this is one of the reasons why there's higher charges for that data. It's not just that it takes money to store it. It takes money to answer queries about any data, given that you have this huge bolus of, of uh, this um, motion sensor data sitting around. And so it, it requires uh, a lot of effort to keep the system performance to keep it um, answering queries about for any study in a timely fashion without being bogged down by this by this ocean of, of motion sensor data. And in general, if you're going to collect that, you really want to know what you're going to do with it. By contrast, something like step count is sometimes a good enough proxy. You can you can do well with it. Um, and um, and it imposes you know, the smallest fraction of the amount of, of storage uh, needs. Um, so storage needs rise with um, sort of the amount of work that goes into answering queries on, on Ethica's side. Um, it goes without saying that the longer you collect data, the more participants and the longer the amount of time, and uh, the more sensors you add in, the larger the amount of data. Um, Survey data is small peanuts. It's small peanuts compared to this. Of course, if your surveys have video, you know, people are going around recording video of, of you know, their, their interactions with their environment, that can, that can also uh, add up some. Um, uh, so beyond that, um, some studies have required some amount of custom development. Ethica used to have a lot of this required. These days, um, I would say um, it's fair to say that uh, most studies, um, and maybe the large majority of studies, uh, don't require custom development. But there's an important subset that do. Um, uh, and that require that is extra cost because it requires software developers time and software developers are an expensive commodity. Um, wearable devices um, impose costs not just because of uh, the data collected, like motion data, um, which can in some cases be voluminous. Um, in other cases, it may be briefer, like sleep data once a, once a day or, or, or summarized step count data uh, over a longer periods. 
but wearable devices cost to buy them, right? And you can get a wristband for something like $100 or less these days, but you know, if you have 100 participants, so you've got $10,000, right? Um, and then uh, phones for low SCP populations can be expensive. Um, uh, recruitment labor can be expensive. Um, um, and uh, in-person recruitment can be, can involve quite a bit of staff time. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it allows you to go through materials um, with the person, address confusions, walk through system function. We talked about this yesterday, so I won't get into it. In fact, that's, that's repetition. Um, so a key recommendation here when it comes to timeline, when it comes to budget, start small and, and, and start um, with a, a smaller, simpler objectives. Um, particularly try things out in small numbers of participants. Try rolling out to a small group. My lab does this a lot um, historically. We, we serve as kind of a test bed for solutions, but you know, you can roll it out among colleagues. Uh, you can roll it out among students. Just try things out to gauge reaction. Are you asking questions too many times a day? Does this form look overwhelming on smaller screen devices? Um, uh, should we break this survey up into two surveys? Um, should we give the option of taking a photo of this or just require a description? Um, people come up with some good ideas. Um, and it turns out that designing surveys in Ethica has some art to it. For example, in Ethica, there are some options which will allow you to see a question that then disappears if it's not relevant. Other cases that question is not seen, it's on another page, and you only go to that page if it is needed, otherwise you never are aware of it. And those can have different psychological impacts. Um, I'm not an expert in human-computer interaction, but sometimes seeing a lot of questions in front of you can, can be off-putting to a participant. They say, oh, you know, I've got a lot to do. Similarly, adding progress, saying you're on page approximately you know, 3 of 12 or 3 of 10 can be helpful um, in terms of, uh, of, of motivating people's involvement. So the point is, try things out early. Perhaps one of the most important features of Ethica, one of the most important advantages as far as I'm concerned, is that to modify things and roll out a new version, that sort of thing can occur you know, in a matter of minutes, not days or months and so on. So what it, it, what it motivates is kind of nimble trying things, modifying them, pushing them out. You know, in an hour's time, you can make some modifications to your surveys, push out a new version, say, let's try this. And that can really allow for refinement that otherwise might take months. Um, if you're dealing with custom software development, often you're dealing with orders of magnitude slower responsiveness to ideas about how to improve it or to change it. Refinements to wording, splitting things up into different, uh, uh, different pieces. So by iterating, you can identify technical concerns, confusions, um, trust issues, um, identify issues with recruitment, um, uh, and you can build the capacity to handle numbers, to address questions that come up when you meet with potential uh, participants, um, and you can change course. So having a pilot study or feasibility struggly, a strong, um, study is strongly advised. Um, and uh, you know, if you, can, if you can do that before launching a study, even if you go through only one IRB process, that's, uh, that's desirable. In other cases, you may want to have a, a separate study that's approved by the IRB, the REB, as a pilot, and then have the full study. Um, but I would advise you for the full study to have some trying things out beforehand. That's what allows you to, to spot issues. Okay, so um, those are some, some comments there. I wanna also comment for just a few minutes, and I'm conscious of the time here, and wanna want, want um, to, to get Mohammed up here to talk about some really exciting stuff about where Ethica is heading. And um, 
some uh, some key components for um, for today. But app development choices uh, are things that come up. Ethica is not the only game in town when it comes to doing smartphone-based research. There are other platforms out there. Um, um, there's also one question I've gotten a lot over the years is, well, why don't we just go build our own app? And uh, I want to talk about specifically uh, that, that issue here. So building apps for smartphones um, is a type of, of software development. Um, and typically, this software development, it goes by the name, people refer to it informally as app development, you know, smart app development or health app development, M health development, um, M health app. But the point is it involves apps and often apps for multiple smartphone platforms, which is notable. But typically for these types of situations, you want an administrative inter interface for the study designers to be able to manage things, like see when was the last time someone submitted data to have some sort of data security mechanisms, security infrastructure, and communication of the data. Some of our earliest studies, we left the data on the device um, and had to collect it. Um, some of the earliest smartphone-based studies we could go and we would plug in the cable and read that data off the device. It would suck it down and we would store it um, on a computer then. Um, uh, but these days, you know, one expects um, uh, to be able to have that data brought back automatically from the phones. And so if you're considering an app to collect data, typically you have to store it and uh, to communicate it back to be stored. Um, and you know, within this context, there's a lot of considerations that need to be balanced. Um, uh, and these considerations point to custom app development versus to Ethica or, or other potential platforms, REDCap, for example, in different circumstances. Many of these are listed here. Um, flexibility, how much flexibility do you need? If, if you want to build a top of Ethica, a sophisticated system for helping, um, uh, helping individuals who are working with mental health challenges navigate a complex environment and link them up to, um, to their friends and family in a flexible way. Maybe Ethica isn't the right tool. Maybe you want to think about a custom development um, system. On the other hand, if what you're doing um, can fit within the round, rounds of what Ethica can offer through built-in tools or through these things called extensions, things like time use, uh, uh, chat, um, uh, tools uh, for expense tracking, et cetera, um, you know, that, that might be the best option. So flexibility is a key thing here. And there's flexibility in terms of prototyping features. I talked about the quick iteration that Ethica offers. Um, uh, Post-initial design, modifying the, the features uh, within the system. Post-deployment, um, so when it's being used by people out there in the field, can they, can you modify something? If you discover a problem or you discover we're just hitting people too quickly with these surveys, we want to back that off and, and have them only once a day instead of three times a day, can you do that once the app is deployed to the field? Um, and as the technology landscape evolves, a new iPhone comes out or a new Android version or iOS version, to what degree can you track that uh, in a flexible um, um, fashion? So flexibility has several dimensions to it. Um, Ethica has worked to, to try to address all of these in a very flexible way. You know, you can have changes to approach deployment. Um, Ethica keeps up with the technology landscape with each new version, and you can quickly iterate in terms of the planned features. For a custom app, this is harder. Um, uh, you know, you might have to have people download the new version of the app from the App Store, for example. Um, a separate set of considerations has to do with development, time, cost, and quality. 
Um, so we have uh, one um, app underway now um, uh, that we started two years ago. It's an app development project which is still ongoing. It's for Apple and for iPhone. Um, during that time, there have been new versions of iOS and so on that have come out. But a lot of what's taking the time is it's for both platforms and we're developing one for iOS and one for Android. And it's two separate code bases traditionally. These days, uh, through um, platforms like Google Flutter or uh, React Native or progressive web apps, you're starting to get the ability again to do development for both platforms in a single unified way. And this is a, um, a development that Ethica is taking advantage of. And some of our projects, such as that being led by Alex back there, are also taking advantage of it. But generally speaking, if you're talking about developing a custom app that's fairly rich, you're talking about the better part of a year to a couple of years um, for, for development. Um, in Ethica, you can prototype a study, you know, uh, within a couple days. Um, in some cases, if it's a smaller type of thing, you could have a version out within a day and, and push it out and refine it. Um, another issue that comes up is IRB buy-in to a custom developed system. A lot of the questions will come up is, is this safe, right? Is this a, uh, is this secure? How do we know that this is acceptable? Ethica has been used for over 100 studies now worldwide, and there's a lot of uh, points of reference in terms of IRB approvals and a lot of successful you know, documentation to back that up, which we're trying to share with you as part of this event. Um, but with a custom app, that can be uh, more challenging to navigate um, because uh, confidence has to be built on the part of the committee. Um, uh, so security, privacy, and confidentiality have to be guaranteed, and then we have to ensure the committee really fully plows into this. This is not a small matter. This requires a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, best practices to be applied on the security front and uh, privacy preservation front. Uh, data storage, uh, backup and curation is another a large side to it. One of the biggest issues that confronts apps once deployed is the issue of maintenance. The, the smartphone landscape is very quickly changing. Mohammed spoke about the changes to the privacy restrictions associated with apps. So Ethica has had to deal with like night and day changes in the Android platform for how, for example, Bluetooth connections are handled over the years. Um, a new version of Android comes out with very different rules for how Bluetooth is handled, and it requires Ethica to, to track it. And it's the same thing with a custom app. Um, so you need to not only have uh, someone to develop it when it gets developed, but someone to maintain it as iOS shifts or, or Android shifts. And Mohammed can tell you, you know, the amount of work that goes into this maintenance issue because as the platforms evolve, it requires a lot of work to keep the app running with the latest versions and with their restrictions and with their, their new rules and ways to handle them. Um, and finally, you know, if you're considering a custom data collection app, there's uh, analysis needs. Um, uh, needs for maintaining uh, interfaces for, for users and for the research uh, team associated with it. Time is short. I want to let Mohammed get up here. But what I will say is one of the most precious resources, there's two precious resources that you got to um, think about first, first off. I guess a third one too. So I'll, I'll list them. Trust, and I put in there security, privacy, confidentiality. This is a resource that once lost is very hard to regain. Secondly, time. We're dealing with custom app development for with very uh, quite long time scales, and uh, those time scales are you know uh, many months to several years um, for very skilled people working on the app. And one thing that goes along with that is high cost because modern software developers um, 
are precious commodities in terms of cost and there are high costs associated with making sure that uh, uh, they are compensated at such a level that they will not leave during the project. So it's routine you know, to go get an app priced for development to anticipate costs in the you know, $100,000 range, something like that. You can get people who will say, well, I'm a student, I can develop it for cheap. And then you've got to wonder, are they going to stick around for the maintenance? Is it going to be developed according to best practices and uh, appropriate levels of security? Um, how long is it going to take? And with what reliability will it be delivered? And is it just the app, or does it really include a management interface and a way of, of, of examining the data and a way to bring the data down and to store it, et cetera? Um, so cost and time are, are two huge uh, considerations. I've tried to put together a, a survey uh, or sort of a summary here in terms of features, which I would invite you to look at. I'll be posting these slides as with others. Um, uh, one of the big challenges we find in the health space is that a lot of standard app developers don't really know the health space. So there's a lot of education that has to go on. It's one of the reasons our lab does a lot of this is because we, we day to day are constantly immersed in health health related topics so there's a certain amount of, of basic knowledge and so I talk about trade-offs here and I've talked about ac uh, custom development options academically or commercial and with consultancy um, uh, so external contracting versus uh, academic development um, I teach software development. I'm, I, I teach um, professional software development at the undergraduate, some at the graduate level. Um, it's complex. Um, it, it matches all the features of complex systems, and uh, it has standards that are very rapidly evolving, best practices that have advanced a lot over the past decade. It involves a tremendous amount of detail complexity as well as systemic complexity um, and uh, it is not an easy thing to manage an effective software development project uh, as Mohammed could uh, could could uh, no help no doubt help us uh, appreciate so a few summary points creation of an app sounds easy but involves a lot of different factors uh, software crossing multiple platforms. At the least, you got to deal with iOS and Android, um, but then uh, typically web. Um, you need to adapt the app uh, response to learning in the pilot phase, which is much more hard to do with a custom app development. It just takes a lot longer to modify it. With something like Ethica, it's, it's something that we've tried to make very straightforward and quick. And then a long-term commitment. This is key keeping the app updated and the study running despite shifting technologies. Um, shifting technologies can make an existing app a non-starter on a new version of iOS. And one thing you've got to stay on top of is, you know, what's going on with this new version and what do we have to change with the app so that it can even run correctly on these new phones without causing security problems or what have you. Software development is complex costly multi-phased endeavor and it's a specialist activity. Um, planning has to be in place for multi-year support, evolution, and curation. Um, uh, and flexibility is key. Um, uh, it's a key consideration in iteration and learning and modification and adapting to evolving platforms. And ethics board credibility is a key asset that can be hard to secure with new apps that, that uh, are homegrown or just contracted out. So those are some comments on custom development. We do quite a bit of custom development. Alex is involved in a custom development project with community partners here. Um, my student Iman, who's out of the country right now, is involved in leading another one. It is something I enjoy, I benefit from, but it is something that has to be taken in light of all of this understanding and it's something I undertake as a professor of software development with some confidence that I can navigate the landscape fairly well, but, um, but even then it's challenging. Cheryl.
is the fact that it has been trial and so many other things. Uh, I've, I work with a lot of people who do um, who have developed their own custom apps just for particular projects. And things that have been non-starters or major issues for them that are just so easy here are things like ethic of being able to work offline to store the data to submit um, on different possibilities, either Wi-Fi only or through data plans or whatever when the phone's charging. Just having all of that stuff built into the app already, it doesn't sound like it's very complicated or very much, but it's a really good example, uh, especially working in rural areas where other app developers just never considered it and then, um, or didn't have something that worked reliably that had been tested amongst, across multiple environments and multiple platforms. And it just didn't work. So just, just wanted to throw that out there as, as an example of where I've seen other people with, with custom apps run, run into trouble. I really appreciate those comments. It's, it's good to hear that you feel those issues are addressed. They are foundational issues. Mohammed could mention that, uh, you know, could, could testify. Um, just how much extra thinking and work has to go in traditionally to, say, making an app work uh, all the time despite being offline versus, you know, only if it's online. It turns out that if you can assume you're online, it really, traditionally, it really simplifies the code base. Today, there's some platforms that are some technologies that are making it, it easier to do, but really it requires uh, traditionally a lot more effort to take that extra step of, of going offline. And it's one of those one of those details which, if you're constantly working within the domain context, health, veterinary medicine, etc., um, you, you're going to appreciate why it's so important. But which your average software developer may easily assume, well, you know. We could just make use of an online um, assumption. Basically, there's 3G everywhere, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and and end up in a bad way. Um, and and so um, I couldn't agree more that often it's those details that that stymie things and which lead to instability or problems with with you know rushed uh, rushed apps, things that are put together quickly. Other questions or comments right now? And we'll okay, uh, well, um, I've taken too much of your time. Uh, you'll um, suffer from me again this afternoon with a lot of discussion on the analysis side. Um, but uh, I want to be sure to give proper billing to Mohammed, who will be uh, speaking with us about um, several uh, smaller items right now. Um, and, uh, and then for discussion of uh, the first part of visualization in Kibana um, uh, after the break. So Mohammed, do you wanna come up right now? Okay, so we'll just uh, 